So welcome, welcome uh, to Telematic, uh, Telematic Media Arts. Uh, my name is Clark Buckner. I'm the director uh, at Telematic Media Arts, where we're currently uh, showcasing uh, Carla Gannis's uh, Wonder Camera, um, an evolving uh, exhibition of new work in XR, uh, rather, R, yes, um, that uh, will be a springboard for uh, much of the conversation today. Um, today we present uh, Art, AI, and the Absurd, uh, featuring artist Carla Gannis, cultural critic Charlotte Kent, and computer scientist Ahmed Elgamal. First off, Carla Gannis is an interdisciplinary artist based in Brooklyn, New York, who works as industry professor at NYU in the Integrated Digital Media Program in the Department of Technology. Sorry, Technology, Culture, and Society. Gannis produces virtual and physical works that are darkly comical in their contemplation of human, earthly, and cosmological conditions. Fascinated by digital semiotics and the lineage of hybrid identity, Gannis takes a horror vacue approach to artistic practice, drawing inspiration from networked communication, art and literary history, emerging technologies, and speculative fiction. Gannis's work has appeared in exhibition screenings and internet projects. Recent projects include Portraits and Landscape, Midnight Moment, uh, which was featured in Times Square, and Sunrise Sunset, which was uh, presented by the uh, Whitney Museum of American Art as part of their Artport project. Uh, next up, um, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Charlotte Kent. Uh, Kent is an assistant professor of visual culture at Montclair State University. With a background in aesthetics and the history of ideas, as well as deconstruction and narrative theory, her scholarship analyzes the power structures surrounding the discourse of art, challenging the way an idea institutes itself as, sorry, challenging the way an idea institutes itself as the primary approach and cordons off other avenues of experience. A deconstructionist attitude to the rhetoric surrounding art and design shifted to reflect on how practices of looking inform expectations of cultural artifacts, particularly as it complicates engagement with digital art. Currently, her research examines objects from the early 1970s as proto imaginaries of the digital age, and she is co editing a collection on the absurd in contemporary art and speculative design. Uh, El Gamal is a professor at the Department of Computer Science at Rutgers University. He is founder and director of the Art and Artificial Intelligence Laboratories at Rutgers, which focuses on data science in the domain of digital humanities. He is also an executive council faculty at the Center for Cognitive Science at Rutgers. Professor El Gamal published over 180 peer-reviewed papers, book chapters, and books in the fields of computer vision, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. His research on knowledge, dis knowledge discovery in art history and AI art, let me begin that again. His research on knowledge discovery in art history and AI art generation has received attention on the Washington, by the Washington Post, the New York Times, The Guardian, The Daily Telegraph, CBS, NBC News, Science News, New Scientist, and many others. In 2017, an artsy editorial claimed his work on AI-generated art as the biggest artistic achievement. His art has been shown in several technology and art venues in Los Angeles, Frankfurt, San Francisco, and New York City. Um, he is the founder of Playform, a platform that enables artists to use AI, which I hope that we'll hear more about uh, today. So without uh, further ado, I'm going to hand the mic over to uh, Carla, is that right? No, we're going to hand the mic over to Charlotte, Charlotte. to um, initiate our uh, discussion today. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you, Clark. So um, for the audience, I'll just explain. Uh, Carla had asked me if I would explain a little bit about my background and my research. So my research really stemmed from Homeland Security Agency's If You See Something, Say Something uh, campaign. And I became interested in this campaign because of the way in which it presumed that you could see something and that you could say something about it uh, without there being a set of rhetorics and knowledge bases that informed both. And that's really when I started thinking about how it is that we produce language around what we see. And the easiest way to really examine that was by looking at the history of art history and art writing and looking at the rhetorics that had been a part of it. 
So that was really where I started uh, developing my research in terms of how it is that we're constrained in terms of what we see and what we interpret. And the social politics around that eventually naturally led me into thinking about digital culture and the way in which that realm had started to influence not only what we see, but also what we say. Most obviously with Twitter, there's been much written about the way in which that has altered political speech and confined things to short jabs, but obviously as well in the way that Instagram and digital media generally has influenced how we expect to see things and the way in which we look at them. It was around that time that I actually met Carla and saw her speak about her work and learned about the selfie drawings. And what was really formidable for me about the selfie drawings was the way in which, because it was this extended practice of daily, weekly uh, digital drawings about herself, it allowed me to begin to think more clearly about not only how we're responding to the larger social situation, but also how it is that artists were thinking about themselves within this context and the way in which the self itself was being expressed in these media. This became even more interesting the following year when she did this entire AR project around it. And so there was so much material that as a researcher that I could use to think through some of these issues. And the more I looked at those images and the more I thought about them and as well looking at various other artists work, I started to see the way in which there was something dark, but also a sort of trying to find humor or wit or something. And I started to investigate that, like what was that little thing that I kept picking up on? And as my switch from interest in state surveillance, there was no way at that point that you couldn't be thinking about corporate surveillance the way in which we're all on softwares and hardwares and platforms everywhere that are sort of being governed by these large corporations and the way in which we're actually becoming this object for them. That is, for anyone who spent any amount of time thinking about it, incredibly depressing. I was researching it so much, it became harder and harder to maintain any kind of levity or hope or engagement. And that was when I discovered uh, that a very similar sort of moment had happened in the mid 20th century when the existentialists were thinking through issues of their moment and Camus wrote the myth of Sisyphus and started thinking about the absurd. And I realized that sort of what I was seeing in various different artists work was the absurd as a way to address this really difficult moment that we're going through where there's this massive social transformation that's happening. My research continues to examine the absurd and I've continued to sort of be interested in Carla's work and what she's doing because of the way in which it has this historical interest. And one of the things to say about digital art is the way that it has often seemed to be removed from quote unquote traditional art practices. And you know, until very recently, people who studied digital art didn't necessarily get an education in art history to potentially be interested in that long lineage of visualizations and storytelling. And in Carla's work, I really saw that. And I saw that this was a shift that was happening in digital art overall, as increasingly programs were introducing that history alongside various other histories and theory practices as well. So at this point, my research really focuses on how the absurd is a way to navigate thinking about history, how we got to the present, in a way that allows us to remain engaged and accountable to the politics that we're currently facing, but not give up and not relinquish hope in the face of so much difficulty and sometimes a sense of despair. And that's what I have to say for now. <laughs> Thank you, Charlotte. Um, so, Ahmed, would you like to go next and introduce your practice and, uh, and research? Um, hi, everybody. Thank you, Carla, for inviting me for this uh, wonderful event. And uh, um, so 
traditionally I am uh, um, an AI uh, um, scientist basically. So uh, I do AI for the last 25 years. And um, what I um, focused on is computer vision, which is basically the field of uh, AI that uh, focus about, uh, on uh, understanding images uh, by, uh, by machines. So um, I realized basically that um, uh, we have a very little um, uh, understanding of art in, in, in AI. I mean, basically uh, the machine can look at images like that and can tell there's a woman, there's a man, there's a tree, but obviously art is not like that. <laughs> when you look at art, you, uh, it's much more sophisticated than that. It's layers and layers of understanding and, and um, it's complex uh, perceptual, emotional, uh, psychological process rooted in history and, and context. Uh, so uh, no way AI is able to, to do anything like that. And, and that intrigued me and, and uh, pushed me to think about how can we push AI beyond uh, simple uh, playing games or driving cars or, or, or uh, problem solving to really cultural uh, product of human like um, visual art and music and others. And that's why I started the Art and AI Lab at Rutgers uh, maybe seven years ago to study these problems and I've been working with many collaborators on that. We, and we work on uh, various problems, uh, starting from a simple understanding of a concept of style or genre or, or, or element of art uh, uh, or understanding basically or trying to discover basically influences between uh, artworks uh, across centuries. Uh, or even try to understand what's what's creativity and and how can we quantify creativity and how can, how can we use AI to look at art history and and uh, uh, understand from something from that. So our ultimate goal is really to to be able to look at art history um, as, a, as a data science um, um, where we, we can really understand the flow of what happened in art history uh, from the visual aspect. Um, 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 which complement uh, other aspects that we know a lot about, like historical aspects and things like that, but to be able to understand uh, the, 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 how human perception and art uh, uh, interact over art history, uh, I think the machine can help us a lot in, in that. And uh, I got interested a lot about uh, AI as a medium for making art, which is more related to what we are going to do uh, here today. Um, so um, over the history of art, basically, uh, uh, of our history of art, we know that um, the long history of making images from uh, Stone Ages uh, to all the way to uh, Renaissance and, and uh, Baroque and, and, uh, mm. and then came 19th century and invention of cameras, which changed the way we make images. I'm not talking about art, I'm not making images in general. Um, um, and then came digital photography in 20th century and came software to manipulate images. Uh, like Photoshop and others, and came graphic rendering uh, uh, tools, make animations, and now we are in the age of uh, AI generating uh, images for us. What that means? It's so another way to uh, make images uh, in a different way from what we have before. What that means exactly in in in, in today uh, uh, and the future of making art? That's what interests me. And uh, I have to point out that definitely using AI um, in, in making art is as old as AI itself. Um, pioneering artists like Harold Cohen have been using AI for a long time. However, the difference is, I mean, uh, this kind of AI was mainly uh, what are more like rule-based systems where you have to rewrite a lot of rules about what the AI will generate. Um, However, there have been a great um, uh, improvement in AI, significant breakthroughs in AI in applying machine learning where the machine can learn by itself from just looking at data. So can we give um, the machine, for example, a bunch of images of, of something like uh, flowers and, and the machine can by itself uh, learn how to make a flower or, 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 or uh, generate an image of a flower um, uh, by just by looking. Um, without having to write any rules about that. And, and basically the breakthrough um, in the last, um, Few years came what's called GANs, uh, generated adversarial network, um, by Goodfellow and others. And in a nutshell, this GAN has uh, uh, make a revolution on on uh, AI, especially in, in synthesizing images. And in a, in a nutshell, basically, it works by um, having um, um, a blind artist who, or, or I, I like to call it alien artist, who come to Earth and know nothing. And uh, we ask that alien to draw um, a, a picture of a flower without seeing a flower. So uh, obviously that uh, alien will just make a random image, uh, uh, nonsense image and give it to a critic who actually knows what a flower looks like or at least have access to these images of flowers. Um, and then the critic will uh, obviously tell them, no, it's not a flower. And then the, the alien have to really improve. 
And after a long, long time of improvement, uh, maybe you can start making uh, uh, forms and shapes that looks like a flower. Um, so it's a long process and, and it, it works to make something interesting. However, when you give this machine, for example, um, portraits um, of um, uh, art um, from art history, uh, what it uh, really do uh, is generating this uh, kind of deformed portraits. I like to call it aesthetics of machine failure, not machine learning, because really what happened here is the machine failed to make an, uh, uh, a proper portrait as we give it in the data. But out of this um, failure come a, a very interesting uncanny look that really interests uh, artists, uh, which is uh, really to remind us of uh, Francis Bacon portraits with a very fundamental mm -hmm. difference that, that, that Francis Bacon has the intention to make these portraits, but the machine actually failed to make something. And out of that comes uh, these uh, uh, interesting uh, results. But AI has advanced a lot in the last few years uh, uh, to make uh, basically uh, photorealistic images uh, of faces and birds and flowers and many things. So between this uncanny look and between this photorealistic look, there's a big spectrum of what AI can do and what, uh, how artists can interact with it. Um, I, I worked a little bit on uh, how to push uh, AI to make autonomous uh, uh, art uh, between quotes. Uh, um, I, my goal is really how to see if, they, if the AI can really can make something creative, uh, not just repeat what we give it. Um, and that's what we call it, uh, um, I can, uh, where we combine theories from uh, psychology of aesthetics and deep learning and art history to develop some uh, uh, sort of autonomous uh, AI artists. However, I'm gonna, not going to talk about this much, much now. Um, my, my, but my interest is really on answering these kind of questions. What artists can do with AI, which we have a great example of today uh, in this exhibition, uh, how artists can use AI, will artists use AI in their work, why and why not, what artists uh, role in this process, uh, what is the uh, AI role, um, how will they integrate AI in their process, uh, uh, how uh, will they integrate AI in their medium, and uh, what uh, artists think of AI? These are the kind of questions that um, um, I am uh, intrigued uh, about. And that's why basically um, I founded a platform called Blayform uh, that uh, really focuses on enabling uh, artists to use AI in their work. And um, what I found out is basically most of AI uh, development co comes from uh, big corporates like uh, Google and Facebook and NVIDIA and other companies like that with artists not in mind at all. I mean, usually these things uh, are developed for, for different purposes, like playing, playing a game, uh, trans machine translation, others. Some artists uh, use these kind of tools or try to use these kind of tools, but, but it's very hard um, because they have to navigate through lots of uh, AI jargons. They have to go through uh, uh, new advances coming every day in AI. They have to have access to a bar for computer GPUs. You have to know how to, uh, to run code or, or uh, download and install libraries and things like that. Very, very hard for artists to really catch up and, and use this kind of AI. If you, for example, go to uh, GitHub, which is um, a famous uh, good, uh, code uh, uh, um, uh, repository uh, for open source code and just search for GAN, uh, what you find out that actually you're going to find like about 35,000 uh, open source codes uh, for this uh, kind of AI tools. So, so from where to start even, it's impossible to, to really uh, figure out uh, um, a starting point. So uh, anyway, we develop a blade form and we keep developing it actually with the help of artists to understand how can we make AI fitting their process, not, not the other way around, not to fit the process of uh, uh, artists to the AI. Um, and I like this quote from one of our users that blade form makes it possible for me to explore using AI without having to have a, a second degree in computer science. Um, so, um, um, I would like to talk about uh, artists and AI roles uh, in, in the human machine creative process. And uh, that's where I, uh, I wanna end my, uh, uh, my little talk, uh, where basically I'd like to show this figure where basically um, uh, the typical process here where is uh, artists uh, feed the machine lots of images based on a concept they're trying to work with. And they choose some AI process um, and maybe tweak uh, this process. And uh, the AI will generate lots and lots of uh, images for them. It might be what they're looking for, it might not. You have to make, go back and uh, treat through this post multiple times, feed different, uh, different images or tweak it, uh, the algorithm differently. Um, uh, and then at the end, the artist uh, both curate the results and use it uh, probably in, in, a, in a bigger project. And this is exactly kind of process that we see an example of today in Carla's work. Um, so the artist role is really involved here in, in the pre-curation, the tweaking, the post-curation, 
iteration to this process and how, how this uh, whole thing uh, fit into a bigger uh, picture. All right, so um, I'll um, um, stop here, I think, uh, uh, to give uh, uh, the floor to uh, the discussion and um, uh, hear about this uh, great exhibition. Thank you. Thank you, um, Ahmed. And so now I'm going to talk a little bit about Wonder Camera to contextualize a conversation that I prepared with a series of questions that I'm going to be asking Ahmed and Charlotte uh, in a little bit. Um, so for those of you who may be unfamiliar with the Wonder Camera Project, for one, what you see behind me is actually the VR version of the Wonder Camera. I call it the main gallery. There are actually several different spaces that you can inhabit in this VR space. Also, you might see as a thumbnail this exact same background, but inhabiting it is a 3D avatar, and that is my avatar, Carla Gann, cross-platform avatar for recursive life action generative adversarial network. You notice Ahmed talked scientifically <laughs> about the GANS model before, and mine is actually an avatar who is a fictional AI, and hence her name. Um, so I will just launch into a little bit about my inspirations for the Wonder Camera, again, as a prelude to these questions that I am looking so much forward to posing to you, Charlotte and Ahmed. So my Wonder Camera project is inspired by the 16th century Wonder Camera, also called Cabinets of Curiosity. Also, I'm fascinated by the contemporary practice on social media of creating archives and collections. Think Pinterest, Instagram, Tumblr, etc. Now, so the traditional Wonder Camera, as a precursor to the museum, most often took up an entire room. And it was filled with art, antiques, natural specimens, scientific instruments, and they were collected from the far reaches of the globe. And they often combined fact with fantasy. Fact and fantasy, sound familiar? Something like the internet. In my Wonder Camera, and that's WWW Wonder Camera, I have collected and created remixes of physical objects, 3D virtual objects, JPEGs, and movie file files from across the global internet, representing topics of interest that include endangered species and the environment, politics, networks, digital semiotics, decolonization and global pluralism, humor as salve and feminist salvation, obsolete and emerging technologies, along with sex and comforting tech. Also, there is a small library. Embedded in every cabinet, both the physical and virtual cabinets and that encompass this show, there are texture maps also of creatures in the cabinets and on environments. All of this imagery embedded into the Wonder Camera was generated using the Playform AI platform. Over the past year, I have trained this AI with image data sets based on those categories I listed earlier. And the Wonder Camera exhibition, as it is currently installed at Telematic and also on the internet via social VR, is organized in layers of virtuality. So the gallery starts as this liminal space, and that is where you see first physical objects, trompoy prints, and a hand painted and uh, carpeted hollow deck. So then there are augmented reality objects and are an augmented reality experience that brings to life a host of avatars. There are fictional robots, embodied AIs, and androids. And they're all inspired by another art historical figure, the Manners painter Giuseppe Arcambaldo. This cast of characters serve as your virtual guide through the Wonder Camera. I call them the seven virtues and vices. And they include a robot politician and influencer, an AI embodied stand-up comedian, among others. And then there's the third layer of reality, which I'm showing in this background today, and that Carla Gann is also inhabiting. It immerses the, views, the viewer, or the visitor, we might say, in an entirely virtual domain. And there is both a desktop VR experience and due to COVID, I've spent the past six months creating a publicly accessible 
social VR experience. And there are a series of spaces beginning with a completely digital reconstruction of telematics gallery. And from there, you can teleport to the main hall of the Wonder Camera, and there are experiences along the way. The main hall is, is again what you see behind me and where you see Carla. A little bit more, I just want to say I was influenced by many things for this work. I've already mentioned the Wonder Camera and also just the practice of archiving and, and creating collections online. But also the 1666 book, The Blazing World, written by Margaret Cavendish. And it is the first science fiction novel written by a woman. And so now I'm actually going to quote Clark Buckner, Dr. Clark Buckner, who runs Telematic, uh, in describing my project because I really love this part. Cavendish conceived of art as a way to construct private symbolic spaces, worlds of one's own. And she saw speculative fiction in particular as a way to imagine a future with more fluid gender identities when women would not be burdened by the constraints of the time. And through, I'll say, my cabinet of curiosities, in uh, Clark's words, I'm also cultivating this transformative potential in speculative invention, revealing the uncanny, uncanny undetermination of the world in all of these virtual realities and conversely calling attention to the virtual as culture, fantasy, and ideology, as much as technology, already at the work and already at work in the everyday. Okay, so that is kind of my introduction to the project. And I hope again, if you're available next Thursday, uh, you will attend the social VR uh, closing party we'll be having and take a spin in these spaces so you can really inhabit it. We'll also be live streaming from the physical gallery and Clark will be taking his computer camera around and showing you the physical installation as well. Now I want to dive into these questions. Uh, so I'm going to begin with you, Ahmed, and my first question for you. In 2017, you authored and, or co-authored a paper on creative adversarial networks, generating art by learning about styles and deviating from style norms. And I find it important that your results indicated, quote, that human subjects could not distinguish art generated by the proposed system from art generated by contemporary artists and shown in top art fairs, unquote. This kind of test isn't really new in, in some ways. I just recall like there was a chimp like in the 1950s, it created this abstract painting and people, studies indicated people couldn't differentiate that from uh, human abstract expressions, right? So I know when you are speaking about your, your platform platform, as you did earlier, you consistently champion the human artist and you make distinctions between style and content and even the idea of failure in the machine. Can you talk a little bit more about that, particularly as a scientist and an arts advocate, your perspective on art viewership and spectatorship in this age? Sure, um, that's a great question. Um, uh, let me um, show you, actually, this is our paper that you mentioned. And as you see here, um, uh, we use uh, art in quotation in the title, uh, um, uh, generating art by learning about styles and uh, repeating from style norm, because uh, that's one of the essence of the paper, uh, uh, what is art and, and um, um, uh, can AI make uh, images and would that consider to be art? So that's really the, the essence. And and give the context of this, let me uh, just go over a couple of uh, um, uh, uh, details about what that work uh, to make sense of uh, what I'm going to say. Uh, so basically, um, uh, if we give, uh, I talked about GANs, and, and what if you give it uh, lots of images of art history, what it will generate? Uh, what usually it generates is, this, as I said, said failures of uh, trying to imitate uh, classical art. Uh, and even if uh, with advances of AI now, it can maybe give us a very good uh, imitation or uh, of, of, of uh, art that you give it. But that's definitely that's not art. If you just imitate what happened before, that's not art because art is about uh, really creating something new, that fundamentally, uh, or at least part of it. Uh, so really, we try to push um, these GANs to be creative, and that's why we create what's called creative adversarial network, where basically uh, we try to. Um, put the machine un uh, under dilemma to be creative. In one hand, it has to follow the aesthetics of what happened before and learn from that. But on the other hand, that we really want the machine to break out of style 
and so it doesn't repeat any uh, art movement or, or or known styles before. Have to come up with something new, but still following the aesthetics. And and uh, as a result, it's, it's start give, giving something that really doesn't look uh, uncanny as a typical uh, gan would look, and and uh, would be um, uh, very appealing. Um, and and if you show this to um, viewers, um, uh, unsophisticated uh, viewers, uh, seventy-five percent of the time they say that uh, this is uh, art made by human compared to only 45% uh, for art made actually by actual artists in Art Basel uh, uh, 2016 when we did this study. Uh, and, and compared to as a, as a baseline, 85% of the time for art actually from art, uh, art um, abstract expressionist uh, masters. And not even that, but actually the people used words like intentional, high, has high visual structure, inspirational, communicative, to describe this kind of AI art with the same level as uh, human art. So what that mean? I wrote an article on the um, uh, New York Times earlier this year in May, uh, where I really, really argued that uh, the robots uh, artists aren't coming basically. So this doesn't mean at all that um, uh, we can make art using AI. What really that means that AI can make uh, images um, um, that um, are, are, um, are kind of novel compared to the data you give it and can be interesting uh, stylistically. Um, but what, what AI is doing at, at the end is just manipulation of form playing with form. That's actually why we call our platform Playform. Um, but art is not that. Art is, is, uh, is really fundamentally is a human communication. Artist has a story to tell in their art. But uh, this study actually what I really highlight is something very important, which is if a viewer come to your gallery and that viewer has no connection to what's, what the context uh, or the story behind the art, uh, really, this viewer can be deceived. You can really put an uh, art made by a machine on the wall and he can think it's made by an artist. Um, and that's why it's very important uh, to highlight what is the story, what is the context, what the artist is doing. And that's why we have a, a talk like that, where we have to hear from an artist and understand uh, what the artist is trying to do. Um, and that's what, what art is. So uh, I really argue that, um, yes, the machine can create images, and the machine has uh, some element of creativity coming uh, and evolving. However, uh, art is done by human and art is done by human for human viewers. Let me unmute myself. Great, thank you so much. Um, so I have a follow-up question um, about that and my relationship in, you know, to working with Playform over the past year and a, and a few months. I don't think of Playform merely as a classical artist tool. Uh, in that, you know, I once was a painter before I started working with digital media and emerging technologies. And my paintbrush never learned from me. <laughs> but I also do not feel threatened by this new kind of interaction and exchange with an evolving tool or even an emerging intelligence. And I am not saying either that Playform is how from 2001 Space Odyssey or her, you know, this woman that you can fall in love with, you know, that's your cell phone. But I do think we have to acknowledge that the definition of art is constantly shifting in relation to new, new cultural, you know, technological paradigms. So my question, what challenges have you faced in advocating for a new studio for artists that involves collaboration to some degree rather than merely tool wielding? Sure, uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, most artists uh, are skeptical about uh, what AI can do for them or uh, with them, uh, especially traditional artists. Uh, um, many artists uh, are turned off by AI. They may be uh, discouraged by uh, fear of AI with uh, its efficiency. Um, um, uh, will it take away jobs of people? Will it take away jobs of, jobs of artists? So all these uh, bias or, or, or prejudgment comes when uh, you talk to an artist about using AI. They may even question the ability of a machine to be creative, um, or they may have a uh, desire to explore AI, but uh, don't know uh, uh, how to decrypt, decrypt that terminology. However, my experience have been consistently that uh, when, we sh uh, when uh, uh, artists, um, after this initial uh, uh, skepticism, uh, um, this will vanish quickly once artists uh, start getting surprising results based on their own input to the AI. And many of them shortly become hooked to the process and try, try it more and more. Uh, and this definitely, uh, there's definitely actually a steep, steep uh, learning curve uh, that might require trial and error and patience. And if artists really go through this, 
really the, the, the become to the point that they find AI as their friend and, and collaborator. And many artists even give, give that AI name uh, and refer to it as, as, as a person. Um, so, but I, I, I find this uh, not surprising because this is the same story uh, again and again, whenever a new technology come uh, that changed the way of making art. Uh, it happened before in photography, it happened before in, in printmaking. Uh, so it always takes time for artists to uh, digest this new technology and try to uh, integrate it into the process and uh, move forward with a new definition and a new, a new evolution of uh, art by this technology. Fantastic. Great answer. <laughs> um, I have one more question for you and then we're going to move to Charlotte. And then I do have a question that I want to bring both of you into this conversation because I think it's really fascinating and I'm so excited you're both here today, you know, in that you both are working with art history and technology, but from these different vantage points. So my um, third question for you, Ahmed, is uh, Charlotte has actually described my Wonder Camera project as an archive that has become database. And so with the development of AI databases that speed up modeling training, model training, and they can ingest, explore, analyze, visualize super complex data within a matter of seconds, or I guess that's milliseconds, how do you imagine this may assist artists using generative tools like AI in the future? Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, that's also a great point. Um, um, so availability of, of images and data sets uh, will, will really make it easier for artists to, uh, to start um, exploring uh, more with, with AI. One of the challenges usually with artists doing uh, work with AI, how to find uh, images to work with, especially most of AI, as I mentioned, comes from all these big corporates, uh, require thousands and thousands of images to, to work and train. And that is one of the barriers that we have to lower when we build a platform where we optimize the process so that you can even work with as with less than 100 images, even as low as 30 images, you can really train your AI from scratch. Uh, but with the ability of more data and artists uh, becoming to the platform, for example, and, and uh, collecting their own images and sharing them, uh, that really encourage a lot other other people, other artists to, uh, to try out new things with different data sets. But what I really imagine the future will happen is that um, um, what if you train a, an AI model and, and now make it uh, uh, available for others uh, to, to reuse? Uh, so others can reuse that model and plug in more data to it or generate from it and then use in another project. Uh, so this AI, train the AI by artists uh, become reusable. Um, so it, 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 and, and at some point it become like our found object that we use in our uh, art uh, projects um, uh, to really take uh, uh, object and, and, and give it another life in another art project. So I think we just sketched the surface about uh, um, uh, what arts can do with AI and um, with availability of data um, in the hands uh, of artists, there's a great possibilities. Rick, uh, I, I love the idea of, you know, AI where you could generate something that another artist remixes. I mean, in the spirit of remix culture, which is internet culture, right? We see it in music, we see it in so many different forms of art and video. And uh, so the idea of, of, you know, generating remixes with AI, you know, uh, that would seem imminent. Um, I'm gonna move to you now, Charlotte. So uh, my first question, for you is based on some of our recent conversations. And Charlotte and I have been, you know, as I've been working with Ahmed and with Playform for the past year and a half, I first met Ahmed at a, a lecture where he was talking about Playform and I immediately was like, I have to hop onto this, I need to learn more. And, and we've had some great conversations um, over the past year and a half. And then Charlotte and I have ha had tremendous conversations for well over two years and most recently about our teaching practices. And you, Charlotte, um, being a scholar in visual cultures, recently you were talking about um, covering reception theory in class. And I don't know a lot about that. And as a novice, I would assume, but I'm always careful or should be careful with assumptions, uh, that th this could relate in some ways to Roland Barthes' The Death of the Author. And this emphasis of a particular reader's or viewer's response and interpretation to a work rather than the intention of the artist. So, 
there's a couple of things I want to say, and some of it has to do with it goes back in some ways to the if you see something, say something quandary that I found myself in. And this is partly also responding to some of the questions you had for Ahmed in that one of the things that I think we're challenged with right now is that we continue to look at all visual artifacts in this really flat way in terms of this end visual product that we receive. And one of the things that's been lost along the way is to understand how things became the way they are, right? And this isn't merely to talk about like process as an art making practice, right? There's this process art that's been really interesting for the last 50 years, but has to do with knowledge really about what does it mean to make a watercolor painting? What, what do you do when you're making a charcoal drawing? Why do you choose one medium over another? what went into a massive visual reality project like the one that you did? What goes into a digital photograph, right? And it's this lack of knowledge of that background that I think is part of why there's this anxiety around um, using AI to make work because it seems as if it's gonna take away this practice that we're a part of, as opposed to seeing it as a really, this is a part of the process in the same way that we use different materials, in the same way that we use, we collaborate, right? Um, and so one of the reasons I introduced reception theory, and this, I'm going to speak specifically in the context of teaching, um, as opposed to a, a larger cultural talking about. Um, I'm dealing largely with art and design practitioners. And I think there's a responsibility to understand not only the intention of what you want to make in our day and age, but also how it's going to potentially be received. You cannot control that as an artist, but you can think about it. And you can prepare yourself for that. And I think that that's something that especially many young artists tend to do this sort of, but what I meant is this as if there were an excuse and a response and obviates responsibility. We're living in a moment in part because of technology, but also because of technology, a kind of global connectedness that does in fact make us responsible for understanding how the types of visualizations that we produce can be received in various different ways. And to recognize that when they go out in the world, they can be interpreted in ways that are not what you meant and that you may be responsible for having to address that. So when I introduce it to students, I'm in a way, I sort of walk them through a bunch of different major uh, theorists. So there's um, Iser who really talks about there's never a perfect match between what the artist made and the viewer. Um, there's also several different theorists who talk about how there's shared communities of interpretation, right? And that we, it's understanding like who's your interpretive community that you're sending something out to and that different interpretive communities can respond differently. And this is one of the things you and I were talking about regarding some of the current issues around like, you know, what's being shown in museums and what, right. what gets displayed. But really one of the things I think is interesting is that Marcel Duchamp, long before these theorists, were you know writing big important papers about it did a talk at MoMA um, it's called the creative act it's available online and he talks about how what completes the work is spectatorship <laughs> um, and that it's the viewer who then actually is the person who takes the art out into the world by sharing it and by thinking about it and by talking about it and by keeping it in some sense alive because they keep looking at it and keep talking about it. And in that sense, you the artist are not this isolated being, you are a part of a larger social network and that larger social network are the viewers who receive your work. Thank you. Um... I'm taking copious notes as both of you speak, and I haven't digested enough to, I'm just going to go to my next question. Um, you know, one thing I, well, actually, I, you know, I think it's just critical talking to young and emerging artists about, or making them aware of the fact that um, they can't control how their work may be received, but it is very important that they think about it. 
And I then am thinking about, um, you know, this thought of visual I imagery of what you both have been talking about, that it can be so slippery that all of it or none of it may be perceived as capital A art. And so much of this seems a lot of times due to norms, fashion, socialization, more than in relation to a viewer or user's visceral or intellectual response to the work. So how, Charlotte, you as a critic, educator, researcher, scholar, uh, art enthusiast, how do you emphasize or construct a model for, or, un or unpack a model for critical viewership? So I always start with the fact that pay attention to your first response. Um, I think, and I, and, I, and I say that to everyone, both students and colleagues and um, artists, when they're looking at artwork, it's like, notice your first response and then begin to unpack that. Um, it's really, for me, a large part of critical viewership is developing a humility to your own vision. Do you understand why you just thought what you thought about what you saw? Do you know where that thought came from? Do you know why you paid attention to some parts of the visualization and not others first rather than something else? Are you prepared to ask yourself questions about that? Are you prepared to ask yourself about what you don't know? I used to do this exercise when I was working with master's students where I would uh, make them look at a work of art across the whole semester. Um, each week they had to look at it for an hour. And they would have to go, it had to be a work that they had physical access to. Um, and so if it was a digital work, they had to be able to be immersed in the digital work in whatever way it was required, or they had to go to the museum or whatever it was. And to sit there for an hour in front of one work, and they could take notes, right? but not to get lost in the notes and really just to keep looking at it. And in the beginning, it's incredibly boring. Um, they would complain about it. And eventually they'd start to see how complex this experience was. And really that's, I think, what any visual critic is trying to bring people's attention to is like, what are some of the things you can notice when you go look at this piece? The thing that concerns me always is that as a critic, I don't want people to only see the things that I pointed out. Right? What's important is to cultivate your vision when you're seeing this. And that's a challenge when I'm writing because I want to leave enough openness that the person is in some ways forced into having to see it for themselves. Um, in that way, I think to the point about capital A art, I don't really care about capital A art. I think thinking about a chair and why this chair is the design now and how chairs came to be is just as amazing and complex to think about. Why are the subway seats the way they are? Why is it that apartments are designed the way they are? I mean, any of these questions, it's about cultivating visuality. It's about noticing the way people walk around each other on the street. That is, that's the terrain of visual culture, is to become aware of the way in which what we do think about and what we don't think about within the visual terrain and how it encounters all the other senses is so integral to the way we choose to live and the way we choose to interact with others. Wow, yes. Um, so much there, again. Um, Taking off from I don't care about capital A art, that I think leads me to my next question for you. Um, and this is in relationship, in relation to the absurd, because we have to get to that, that's in the title of our talk. The absurd, the satirical, and the cartoonish. And so I've been thinking quite a bit about Philip Gustin lately, uh, even before the ballot who about canceling the 2021 exhibitions of his work. Uh, and I really appreciated uh, watching Trenton Doyle Hancock's video interview on Art Forum. He has a show currently up at, um, at uh, James Cohan Gallery. And, um, and in it, he talks about his work and, uh, and about taking on Philip Gustin's, Philip Gustin's characters in his work with Trenton Doyle Hancock's alter ego that he's had since he was 10 years old, Torpedo Boy an African-American superhero. 
Anyway, bringing it back to me, as a kid, I loved drawing comic book characters and playing video games. And I actually loved doing that more than my classical piano lessons and my formal painting lessons, right? And so, you know, figures like Gustin and the more contemporary Doyle Hancock, they are really inspiring to me. And they're inspiring though, not just the aesthetics, but the social truths that they speak to, painful social truths. And they're depicted in this cartoonish manner, but you know, which until the 1960s was considered a low art aesthetic. But, I, but getting to the point of my question, yes, get to the point, Carla. What role do you feel the absurd, the satirical, even the cartoonish plays in art and beyond that in local or global culture today? Well, the first thing to say is I, I want to distinguish between satire and cartoon and the absurd. Um, they all have their place, right? Um, I mean, it's difficult to talk about the cartoonish, and I'm not going to talk about it too much because it's so much to unpack. I mean, are we talking about caricature? Are we talking about, you know, certain ways of moving images? I mean, there's just a lot there. So, um, thinking about your reference to low art, it's, it's the way in which it's super accessible, right? It's, a, it's this kind of accessible uh, medium to discuss various different things. It also has a racist history, so it gets complicated. I'm just gonna put that to the side for a moment. Um, the satirical is about poking fun at. And in that sense, I'm not particularly interested in the sat satirical either because it's, it's sort of staying within the same boxing ring, as it were. What interests me about the absurd is the way in which it problematizes the current constructions of meaning. Um, a perfect example would be, it's ridiculous. I mean, what, what on earth do I mean when I say I'm not interested in capital A art? Like, I'm a, I'm a visual culture person. I talk about art all the time. I write about artists. I'm interested in obviously interested in capital A art, right? So on one hand, yeah, I'm interested in this capital A art. On the other hand, there's a problem with capital A art, the way it's still anchored by certain ways of thinking. And that conflict is where I think the absurd does really important work because it's a device in a sense that really, I, I, I think it's a very difficult device to manage. I mean, there's a reason why Samuel Beckett is a genius, right? But when, when artists can negotiate the, the absurd and produce it, it allows us as viewers to do this kind of double take, to go, I just understood that, wait, that makes no sense. And in that moment, we're really positioned in the problem of the moment, that there's a system that is deeply familiar to us that presents ideas and knowledge that we've accepted de facto. And yet that doesn't work. And that system is, problem, is a problem that we know we want to unpack. How do you want, and so in that sort of back and forth moment, the absurd positions us to begin to think about what would it be otherwise? And so the absurd doesn't produce solutions, right? Often political art will advocate for a type of solution. And so in that sense, the absurd doesn't necessarily appear as political. But I argue that just to think about something deeply in that way is a political step. And for those who can't continuously have faith in the power of like making more progress or don't know what the solution is, um, the absurd is a way to not have to give up, but not have to be responsible for coming up with the answer. Um, so eloquently put, uh, I, I, I think about speculative design here, you know, and I, I think generally in a lot of speculative design work, there's that absurd proposition where it's asking questions instead of, because so much design is about problem solving, but with speculative design, and I kind of describe my work as speculative art in a way, mm -hmm. it's asking these questions when you're in this kind of uncomfortable zone and you don't know a solution, but you know you have this burning question. And, and that is where the absurd kind of emerges, as you said. 
Um, I know we're getting close to the hour mark, so I have one more question that I want to pose to both of you before we end. Are you, are you okay with that? Can you hang out a few more minutes? Okay. Um, in 2020, biographical context complicates much of our viewing or reading of an artist or author's oeuvre. Um, the assumption could be made, based on these conversations we've already been having, that if an AI creates a work of art, it is unbiased, without the baggage of a human lifetime, filled with you know, all sorts of gestures, an existence of extreme inspiration, and at the same time, callousness, prejudice, malice, all these bad things. Now, of course, where we are right now, the human is seeding the AI. So bias often is kind of implicit through that process. Now, my question to both of you, is art as we define it today, is it rooted in the pain of the human condition beyond anything else? And I'll let you answer that and then I have a follow-up question. Charlotte, can I go first or uh, can I go first? Either way, I've got thoughts, I'm sure you do too. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just wonder, I mean, why, it's, uh, it's, uh, why you want to have uh, unbiased, uh, unbiased uh, art uh, to start with. I think art is all about the human, um, uh, um, the artist bias that comes into the process. I, I, I don't see it as something that's gonna get rid of. Otherwise, because at the end, if you remove that, you move in the story, you move in the, the context, what art will be? I mean, it's just manipulating uh, uh, form at the end, uh, which would be basically ultimately uh, like something like autonomous AI, even if you think an autonomous AI that makes art, what, what will be the data that we fit to that AI, still will be uh, some human art that has went through a process of historical selection. And uh, so I, I can't imagine a way uh, we can get a robot and put it in the forest and get data randomly from the forest and, and it can generate based on that. And I still, there is some, I don't know. I mean, I think, I think, uh, this is something essential to art, to have uh, this human bias built into uh, the artwork. I would, I would agree. I, I think the issue isn't that there's bias. It's the fact that right now that bias, especially in the context of artificial intelligence and the sort of algorithmic world that we're living in, is that it's unknown to the audience. Right. In part, one of the things biography does is help us, because we psychoanalyze and so forth, get a glimpse into what was the thinking mechanism that produced this work. Right. It's, it's, a, part, it's a way of trying to navigate, like, how, it, how do I understand whatever biases I may observe in this visual object? Then right now we don't have that with AI. And that's one of the reasons why a lot of um, you know, data advocates and so forth are arguing for the fact that all that's necessary is to explain what are the data sets? Where did they come from? Who participated in them? What is this information? How is it used? Let us know. If you know what the AI is generated from, right, what the product is generated from, then you can begin to interpret what bias is potentially there. And then there's a dialogue. Right now it's the fact that it's hidden that I think is the problem. And that makes it seem... Um, terrifying. Yeah, I just want to have uh, one final note about that. Also, one of the things that we intentionally did in Playform is to make AI accessible to artists that, such that we train it from scratch without any built-in bias, which is, I think, a very fundamental thing. Most, most AI available comes with lots of training uh, on, on human faces or objects or things like that, and you can work on top of that. We don't like that. Artists don't like that. Artists want to basically plug in their own images to uh, plug in their own story in the work. Uh, so the bias only comes from the artist, not from anything else. So no data bias coming uh, built in in the AI. I, you know, if I, if I can, while we're waiting for Claudia's question, I do have questions. Um, you know, uh, Charlotte, your uh, remarks come first to mind. And I wonder in your thinking about, um, in your thinking about the power of humor, say, um, is it specifically satire? I mean, when you get into comedy, it seems like it is, comedy is really uh, polyvalent, right? And part of it gets us thinking and things are incongruous and strange, but part of it's very cruel and part of it is like a relish and enjoyment. I mean, um, 
do the politics of humor, uh, do they require kind of a parsing of what's uh, progressive humor and what's reactionary? Absolutely. I mean, the philosophy of humor, theories of humor are uh, really actually oddly interesting to read. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I really position the absurd as not being solely within humor. Um, it's not, I think that that's a misunderstanding of the absurd. It's the way in which it falls into the ridiculous sometimes. The absurd is tragicomic. It doesn't satisfy either. It's this, um, I often talk about it like, you know, laughing is this exhale. Um, shock is a kind of inhale. And the absurd makes us do both. You know, you, you start to laugh and then you realize, whoa, what am I laughing at? You sort of inhale quickly. And it's, a, it's that dichotomy that the absurd produces that I think is so interesting. Uh-huh. So it's not even the more broadly the humorous, but the absurd, and, and as you introduce, sort of as a as a more fundamental philosophical concern. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, Ahmed, can I? You know, Claudia. It turns out she wants to ask her question, and and of course we just have a, have a chat. So uh, she's going to hold her question, and um, just uh, now that I'm going with it, uh, Ahmed, I was really interested to hear about your experience with form and with, first of all, I love that title about the robot artists aren't coming, right? Uh, it's a, that's a great term. Um, but what, you talk about the, the AI as a machine failure. And I appreciate the generative effects of failure. So I don't necessarily mean to, um, you know, take that as a negative thing. But I wonder if the machine necessarily fails. I mean, it only fails relative to somebody else's intention, right? That's maybe the difference with Bacon because nobody told Bacon what he was supposed to be painting, right? And to that extent, the failure seems almost more like a, like a refusal or a, like a, a point of uh, resistance. Uh, could you consider that? Um, well, uh, no, <laughs> I think the machine failed because uh, uh, the way I describe it is that basically in, in this kind of AI generation, um, it, we usually uh, have a task to the machine. We give it data sets and we tell the machine or, or program the machine to really try to simulate this data set or generate things similar to that data set. And the kind of uncanny look that we get is really short of the machine of really generating that. And from, from the scientist's point of view, they really always try to push it to, to generate something in terms of better quality, similar to what we give it. So if the machine actually doesn't fail, it would end up uh, generating something that would not be interesting uh, for me and, and for most uh, artists. I think that the, this failure, as you said, is what makes it interesting. But it is failure in the sense that the machine didn't have the intention to do that. It's just, uh, and, and definitely, I don't think, uh, the machine definitely doesn't have the, the consciousness to, to to, do, to refuse uh, uh, what we give it. Uh, so the machine simply just uh, fails short of uh, doing the task. Uh, and, and as I said, I mean, now AI improved a lot to the point that it really can generate uh, faces that are fake faces that we cannot tell whether they are fake easily or other objects. And, 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 and that becomes, um, uh, for me, it's, uh, I, I lose interest uh, in this kind of generation uh, in terms of uh, uh, how it's, it can be used in an artistic uh, uh, point. Maybe it has other applications, but uh, I'm really interested more in, of, of that failure of the machine and, and, and what it gives us uh, as a surprise, because surprise is a fundamental element of making art. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, Claudia adds to these notes, actually bringing the two presentations uh, together, says that it fails because there's no interaction with the audience, that there's no audience reception, essentially. Totally, it's very limited. Um, yeah, the, this kind of machine is, is really working with, with one audience, which is um, the critic that is built in into the process that uh, have access to these images. So it's it's really very simplified uh, simulation of reality. Yes, and um, Judith adds, excuse me, Judith adds, oh, uh, Claudia asked, could Charlotte respond to the point too? Respond to which point, sorry. Well, talking about uh, reception theory in relationship to AI generated art. And failure, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm i not sure that this is going to answer the question that Claudia wants me to answer, but I'm going to answer the question I'd like to answer, which is that 
like I said before, I think the failure is that we're not, there isn't enough knowledge out there yet right now about these practices. The failure is that it's impossible to have, you know, reception theory on some level because people don't know how the thing works. They don't understand how to respond on some level. And so A, either that makes it, you know, facile, easy to reject, right? Or it produces a situation where people feel distressed and um, that anxiety of like, oh, you know, there's the art robots are going to take over. Um, anyone who's never used Photoshop doesn't understand how long digital images can take to render, for example, right? I mean, I remember, Carla, one of our first conversations was, you know, your comment that, you know, how you used to be a painter, you'd have to wait for paint to dry, right? You have to wait for images to render, right? Like yeah. vast images take a long time and it, people don't necessarily think that. And so they think of it as this really easy thing. And that means that they can't ex receive it in the same way. People look at watercolors and don't understand wet on wet versus, you know, wet on dry and what a massive difference that makes in terms of what the person is producing. Um, you know, when you think about the way in which you produce, you know, and even an animated GIF, right? It's when you watch someone go through the steps of doing it and the way they figure out shortcuts and the way they figure out how to make these things happen, that's when it becomes interesting. And then you can look at these works and get really stimulated by, oh, I'm interested in what they did. It's akin to getting up close and looking at the brush strokes, which people love to do when they're in front of a painting that is, you know, Rubens. And you're like, what is going on here, right? We don't think we can do that yet because we don't know how to think about it. And I think that that's, you know, something we're all responsible for trying to, I mean, I don't want to say educate, but on some level, like educate audiences about what they're looking at. It's not just content. There's a formalism at stake here. And we've forgotten about the formalism. And I think it's important to bring it back into the conversation. Your remarks anticipate uh, Judith's comment. Uh, in fact, she says uh, that she was thinking about resistance in Charlotte, your um, exposition about critical practice um, and the matter of allowing time to process things uh, deeply. To, to refuse the, the to refuse the assumptions that we're working with otherwise and to uh, critically reflect. Yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, one of the things I think is really interesting about Playform and one of the reasons I'm interested in it is that is part of what Ahmed was talking about. Um, it invites, there's, a, there's an interesting way in which what Ahmed, you know, produced here with Playform is it invites curiosity, invites you to want to know how does that work because of the way it's made in a way that, you know, we often don't think to think about Photoshop <laughs> um, until it's making fakes that people flip out about on the news and so forth. Um, and I think that that's part of what that slow art movement of, you know, 10, 20 years ago was about. Um, it seemed at the time to just be about general slowing down, but I think it's about this kind of critical thinking of the world that we're generating. Mm -hmm. Ahmed, I wonder if there isn't a variation of these same concerns, distinction that you drew between the artist being able to use the AI on the one hand, or the artist kind of becoming instruments of the AI because it's got, I take it, something like um, prescribed rules. Um, I, I think with the current um, um, uh, state of the art of AI and, and for, for a long time to come, uh, I think um, AI will always be a kind of tool for, for the artist, not the other way around. Um, uh, uh, it's, it's, um, um, uh, AI is very limited now into what it can do. Uh, um, it's, it's, it has some creative element, definitely have some elements of surprise, which comes from failure or trying to explore uh, part of the visual space that we don't anticipate. But at the end, it's, it's, it is um, the artist who is in control. Um, at least on some control. Uh, these, some, as Charlotte was mentioning, I mean, there is part of the process that, that uh, beyond our understanding um, of why things comes, uh, probably beyond the understanding of, of artists and even scientists who made this uh, algorithm, 
and and we keep under, uh, pushing the understanding more and more. Um, but um, I think um, it will always be uh, the case that uh, AI is uh, a tool in the control of the artist. It's interesting, though, I'll just mention, because in our talk last week, Ahmed, uh, that was one of the questions one of the audience members had, because she pondered, we had all talked about using Pla Playform as a tool for our arts practice, and she was like, oh, how does it use you? And I didn't think in terms of Playform kind of evolving me in some way that's manipulative, but as I've learned to work with it, I do feel this, you know, kind of going back and forth, you know, as you, as you talked about the pre-curation and then the generation process and then the post-curation, and then you have to do it again sometimes. And through that, there is a learning cycle. And in some ways, I feel like I'm learning from the machine in that way, but not in the sense that, you know, it's an autonomous agent that is, you know, treating me like a puppet, right? Yeah, I just also wanna, I think it's very relevant to this, if I have a, a, a minute, uh, let me um, um, just show something here. Uh, yeah, we had a paper actually um, uh, a couple of months ago uh, that was published in Art Nodes, uh, where actually we talked to uh, talked about these uh, issues. Um, um, uh, this is a quote with um, art historian Maria Mazzoni from College of Charleston. And we talk to artists, we use Playform and try to uh, understand what's happening. And this is some of the findings, I think, relevant to the question. So artists understand AI as a major impetus to their own creative process in allowing them to generate lots of imagery quickly and suggesting new paths of manipulating uh, uh, and disruption of data to create images. For them, it's a vital step in leading them to seeing their own uh, artwork dif differently. So we have an artist another set of eye that can see my work differently than any human. Um, are they described the relationship uh, to AI as a partnership, believing there is a real value and potential in pursuing that model? The biggest gain are to be found in creative uh, inspiration and creative volume. Um, our relationship to, uh, this, this is my conclusion, is that our relationship uh, to a computational system as human beings is only uh, going to become more critical and that artists need to understand that relationship, be involved in it, uh, developing uh, literacy, and uh, hopefully shaping the relationship, uh, shaping this relationship. If I can just add, I mean, that last point I think is crucial. I mean, one of the things that digital artists are doing is in some ways being knowledge experts about the relationship to computer technologies, machines, and helping us, the rest of us, reflect on that. Um, that's what art has always done, right? I mean, here I'm talking about capital A art again. Um, but that's what capital A art has always done, is help us think about, you know, this as some aspect of our lives, some aspect of our position in the world. And digital artists are doing that vis-a-vis -vis these machines that are obviously in the last six months especially, but have been increasingly huge parts of our life pr producing the lives that we are living and we need digital artists to do that okay literacy crucial clark are there any other questions or comments okay you know even if there were i think we owe it to the audience late. to uh <laughs> Say, sign off for now and uh, thank you both. Thank you all three of you for your uh, participation today. This was a terrifically stimulating uh, exchange. I've learned a lot and I will uh, follow up with you all. So a final thank you, Charlotte and Ahmed for taking this time and actually extending yourself to uh, 20 minutes after our scheduled talk time. Uh, this was, yes, tremendously stimulating and I look forward to continuing conversations with both of you. So thank you all who attended today as well. Cheers, thank yes, thank you. All thank right, you, bye everyone. Ciao.